Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. Uh, today, I have a special guest, uh, Mike Van from Trident Monthly Family. Mike, how are you today? Doing great, Chris. How about yourself? Good. In today's episode, we're going to talk about being able to scale a business while also working a full-time job. And I look at myself having been able to scale, you know, my note investing business. And then I found uh, Mike through um, Common Acquaintance. And Mike has really been able to take uh, his real estate business to the next level. So I'll let you give everyone a quick intro before we start rolling into some of the things I want to talk about today. Sure. Uh, so appreciate you having me on the show, first of all. And, uh, you know, like uh, a lot of folks, um, you know, we all start off with our nine to five. And and uh, the way I kind of got into real estate investing, um, do, you, do you want me to just uh, give you just a brief, brief bio of what I've done in real estate first, and we'll get into the questions of how and why? Yeah. Or, yep. Okay. Yep. Nope. Yep. Sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah. Like a lot of people, I started out, you know, single families, duplexes, small multifamily, stuff like that. And then um, got into uh, some fix and flips during that big beginning of that craze. And um, <clears throat> and then when the credit crunch hit, uh, my thought process was, oh, no, if no one can get credit to buy my flips, then I'm going to stop. And had I been more educated at the time, I would have actually been going all in buying, doing buy and holds and, you know, buying at the bottom dollar prices, renting them, and then uh, waiting for the, the price to come back. Um, but throughout the process of between eight and 10, I had been further educating myself and realized, oh no, <laughs> I'm missing out. So jumped back in and, and um, started putting fillers out and found a bank owned, um, 16 plex and uh, bought that um, cashed in some stock options and uh, and bought that uh, piece of property and um, then uh, you know probably missed out on a few deals after that because it was such a good deal that I got on it um, I expected everything to be like that uh, so anyway I, I got a little bit more realistic and bought a few more properties over the over the last several years and then in 17 I um, actually sold that first 16 plex and 1031 that into a 55 unit complex. Wow. And, uh, and then that was in 2017. And that's about the time that I started thinking about syndication, uh, as a, as a scale strategy, um, to really scale. And, uh, so then joined a mentoring program, met, uh, several operators uh, who were doing what I wanted to do and were at the level I wanted to be at. And, partnered up with a few of them and, and uh, between 2017 and now um, I've accumulated on the, uh, as a general partner myself along with other people in the partnership um, about a thousand units. Wow. And, and you still working full time? Still working full time in the medical device <laughs> industry. Yeah. So, yeah. so just so I get that. So your general partner basically of a thousand units and working full time. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, that, that may sound like a, a lot and, and it is a lot of doors, so to speak. Um, but there's various roles in each of those partnerships, you know? Um, so, you know, a lot of people will, will use the, uh, you know, the, we, uh, we own this or we do that. Um, when really, you know, they may not, uh, own a significant portion of, of any of those deals, you know, um, if any, they may have just, been a KP on, on, you know, a thousand doors or whatever, but, but no, I, uh, my first two deals, I did KP on mm -hmm. those, um, to get my, you know, my fanny Freddie gold card, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh, and then the next three deals I did after that, I was co-sponsor on. Okay. So, you know, I'll talk a little bit later about that because I know one of the most important factors is putting great team around you in place. Um, you know, and that's one of the things and I'll touch base about that and also mentoring in a little while. Um, sure. Something I want to talk about that. But first question I was going to ask you is why real estate? You know, what got you involved in real estate? I and mean, it sounds like you had some stock options. You were in the markets and so forth. What was mm -hmm. your uh, desire to get into real estate? Well, you know, the, uh, through, my corporate job, I uh, did have 401k and, mm. and uh, did some day trading here and there. Um, but really, you know, what, it was one night 
whenever uh, I was watching one of those late night infomercials and saw the saw Carlton Sheets ad, you know, with the with the big Jaguar behind him and the giant house and the palm trees and all that stuff. I was like, well, that's the kind of money I really want to make. And, and you know, making my uh, six to, to eight percent on the 401k is not going to get me there. And uh, so I started looking into real estate at that point. And then, you know, bought the course. And it, of course, after that, it sat on the shelf for a, a year or so um, until I, I was told to wait by the phone. And as we were going through some restructuring and, and told to wait by the phone one day and see if I would have a job. And so uh, after I made it through that uh, phone call successfully, I realized that, hey, I'm just a number to corporate America. So I needed to do something on my own to, um, you know, establish uh, some, another source of income. And, and I thought real estate would be that best uh, choice for that. Yep. So good. Um, and with the, you know, nine to five and, you know, managing like that, that first, what was, you know, getting started, what was the, your biggest choke point of just making that, like you said, you saw the infomercial, you took the training, it sat for a year. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, was there a moment, in, like you said, it was a moment where you were on the phone call about, you know, I need to do something, but, you know, being able to say that and actually doing it is also, again, another level of confidence that's required and so forth. Was there something, you know, at that point in time, were you confident going into the deal or is it like, you know, one of these things where, you know, what, I'm just going to try this and see what happens. Just curious. Cause you see many yeah. different people try it from different avenues. Right. I mean, you know, there, you, you do, you see a lot of people, um, you know, get super educated on, on, uh, mm -hmm real estate investing go to all the meetings and all the conferences and then never buy a deal yeah, analysis um, paralysis is what we call it <laughs> right exactly uh but no um you know i i have confidence in my own abilities and mm -hmm. uh i did have some some construction knowledge uh so I, I knew i could do a lot of the work myself um initially and so um yeah i, I just went out and, and dusted the course off read through it went out driving for dollars and, and then uh, put the stuff to, to work and ended up closing the first property I found, um, got cash back at closing and then did the work myself, managed it myself and realized that I'm not cut out to be a landlord. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, uh, you know, driving for dollars stuff and one of your keys from, you know, doing a little bit of a uh, diligence on you is you like to stick to typically a specific market, correct? Um, or, or initially you, I did, okay. I, uh, I stuck to the market I knew uh, the yep. market that I lived in. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to start. Um, mm -hmm. it's where, you know, I think that the more, the more, um, pieces you can put in place to make you feel comfortable about taking that jump is going to make you actually take action. You know, sticking with a market that you're, that you're comfortable with, you're, you're mm -hmm. confident in. Um, and then, you know, obviously knowing your numbers, uh, and building a good team around you is going to get, give you the confidence to, to, um, you know, take action, which is the hardest part for a lot of people to do is just take that, is take that first step. And then once you, um, you, know, you get that person under your belt and, you know, sky's the limit from that point on. Yep. Yeah. It's, you know, similar in my experience, you know, got the first, you know, bought a few, initially under the belt and once you start realizing it's like okay you know you make mistakes here and there but nothing i'd say mm -hmm. that's catastrophic um right you know and uh, you know you learn from it you keep going and you know the money typically you put in early on is the money that hey you know you, you have to potentially expect maybe you might lose some of it but at least you know you better learn from it is the most important yeah thing, yeah know? i mean you know and honestly i mean I hate to say it's hard to lose money in real estate if you, but if you, it really is kind of hard to, to lose money in real estate, if you do proper due diligence, you know, if you have a good fundamental education about it, you do proper due diligence and you're not so hungry to get a deal that you put on blinders and miss a lot of things that can get you in the hole. Um, it really is hard to, to, to lose money in real estate, yeah. although it can be done. Yeah, it can be done and it happens, you know, on occasion depends on just, you know, stuff may happen to people. But like sure. you said, I, you know, I see people like on, you know, the website, bigger pockets, somebody posted something the other day that they were trying to, you know, buy a property, um, rehab it and then refinance it to get their investment out of the deal. 
and the person ran the numbers but forgot to take into account the cost for the renovation. And you know, I'm sitting there like, and I'm reading this and I'm like, Pretty basic. Yeah, yeah. So there's, I mean, some real generic basic things, but you know, and the other thing that I like to tell people is, you know, and this is kind of rolls into, you know, the mentorship component to it is if you don't know something, you know, like you mentioned, go to these groups and stuff, ask people and find someone who kind of, you know, that fits your niche a little bit and, you know, don't have to be a full blown, have them be a full blown mentor for you, but at least use them as a resource and use people as a resource because a lot, I mean, I find in real estate, a lot of people do like to help people to, you know, to some extent. Absolutely. There, so, there is a mm-hmm. significant abundance mentality in this industry and mm-hmm. with the resources available today through the internet and all the, mm-hmm. the you know, blogs mm-hmm. and podcasts mm-hmm. and uh, websites, I mean, there's really almost no excuse to not be, well armed going into uh your first deal and yep. uh and you know people there's a lot of free advice out there may not all be good advice but there's a lot of it <laughs> yeah that is true um so tell me a little bit about this uh the mentorship program uh because you know a lot of people talk about either these mentorships or masterminds and you know to me these types of programs are really when you're dealing with um you know people who are you know, experts or people who have value add, sometimes I see these, you know, these types of programs, unfortunately, get so big that especially when they call them masterminds, and it's really not a masterminds, it's just one or two experts, and then 50 people who are just looking to learn, which really doesn't, I'd say benefit a lot of people. Uh, but I'm interested to hear um, about the mentorship, because I know, uh, a lot of people go through these types of programs um, and some with success, some without. And I think mm-hmm. it really depends on who the mentor is and the person actually willing to take what they're learning and implement it. So, right. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, you know, there's a, I was pretty skeptical of, of gurus and, and things <laughs> like that uh, when I first started looking into it. And, um, you know, I, th- I would say, A, the the person you look to, um, you know, get into a mentorship program with needs to be doing what it is that you seek to do. They need to be doing what it is that they're teaching and not just have done it, you know, once or twice or a handful of times or had done it, you know, 10 years ago and now they're just teaching. They need to be actively doing it right now in, in today's you know, current market climate. Um, and also too, you need to be able to have, um, you know, verifiable um, information from their students, you know, either that you meet them at, at networking events or, or whatever, um, to know that they're successful in, in teaching what it is that you desire to learn. And so I, I look at a few different programs and I, I didn't join a mentorship program to learn about the, the fundamentals of real estate. Uh, I joined a mentorship program, specifically a, an apartment syndication mentoring program mm-hmm. to learn about the, you know, all the moving pieces in a syndication, you know, the SEC compliance pieces, the different lending aspects uh, of, of commercial real estate. Um, and also too, uh, to be able to, network and form relationships with people who are doing what it is that I sought to do, you know, high level operators who were buying apartment complexes and operating them, um, you know, successfully. And so not only was the mentor, the mentor himself doing this actively at the time and Mm -hmm. still continues to do it. Um, but he had a number of successful, students who were who had in the past and currently are still doing um, apartment syndications and then there was an opportunity to meet other operators and partner up with them potentially and then also too within the group you could actually raise money from members of the group as well so you had kind of a built-in capital stack somewhat uh, at least partial and um, so that's how I formed the first two partnerships that that uh, on the first two deals I did is I met them through the group and I was a KP on their deals. Mm-hmm. Um, one was 132 unit, one was a, a 243 unit. And I did the two different deals so I could have, um, you know, a midsize and a larger deal on my, on my quote resume from mm-hmm. a Fannie Mae perspective. 
<clears throat> um, so whenever I was ready to go out and, and you know do my own sponsorship, then I I had that gold card, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, then I met the the partners that I have now. I met them. Uh, I met them early on, and we had you know we had all done deals with other partners that we had met in the group, and we decided to start pursuing deals together. So we did our first deal uh, together, the three of us, um, early last year. And we all did that under our own separate LLC entities. And, you know, I would suggest doing that because, um, you know, partnerships like a marriage and you want to really know who your partners are going to be and know them well before you get too, you know, too, in, too tied together. Um, and so uh, we did that deal, worked very well together, had th some great synergies. And then after that uh, deal was done and we had closed it, we decided um, to formalize a partnership and created Trident Multifamily. Okay. And then uh, we did another deal under the Trident banner uh, late last year. Okay. So, and yeah, you mentioned like your partnerships and kind of, it's like a marriage and stuff. And it also kind of relates to, you know, the due diligence side of things where a lot of people just spend focus all their time on due diligence on the asset, but you also got to make sure you do the due diligence on anyone you're bringing into that deal as well. And that's one thing I see some people, um, you know, sometimes uh, may lack some of the uh, credentials or requirements and sometimes it can really come back to, to bite you on that. Um, yeah. And if you're a passive investor, you want to do due diligence on your sponsor as well. Yeah. So, you know, one question I want to ask is because you've been able to, you know, grow and scale and, you know, a lot of people always have, you know, the challenge of, you know, raising money. And I'm curious, have you ever been able not to raise money for a deal? No. Okay. No, there's, um, that was, uh, you know, that was a concern because uh, my whole real estate career, I'd, I'd done things on my own yep. and, you know, I, I uh, um, you know, working in the medical device industry i know a lot of high net worth individuals but from a conflict of interest standpoint i, I couldn't really access those those yeah. individuals uh yeah. you know um due to, due to those constraints but so i was a little concerned on how will i be able to you know raise million or two million dollars on my on my own um and uh, so that's one of the reasons that i joined the program is is a to uh you know to have access uh to the information and the networking but also to have access to additional sources of capital yeah. but no um we've never had any issues raising capital for the deals there's plenty of money out there um you just have to know how to uh how to go out and find it yeah but another three trillion last month i think they printed so yeah there's definitely the money yeah. there. <laughs> right um, but yeah and i make that point because you know sometimes people will try and make excuses on why they can't do things. And, and it's not easy. I mean, you know, nothing is easy in life. And if, you know, something's easy, then you should be asking yourself, okay, what's going on or something doesn't seem right. Um, you know, certain tasks may be easy, come easy to you, but you know, nothing is easy, but in the same sense, you know, a lot of people, you know, have that fear of, you know, they use their money initially and then, okay, I'm going to go out and raise money. And it's like, okay, where do I go? Where do I do? And kind of like you said, you know, I have a similar instance where, you know, I have conflicts of interest with my work where I keep it completely separate. Um, and, you know, you go that path, but if you put yourself around the people you either want to be like, or, you know, and that's, I think, you know, I forget which book it is, but they say like, you're the average of like the five people you spend the most time with, you know, mm -hmm. and that's one of the keys that, you know, I'm picking up from this conversation is you really thought through and, you know, planned everything out and also organized to the sense of, I want to be around these people because if they're successful, then that success will spawn off possibly on myself if you do the work. Sure. And that's, it sounds like that's what's happened. That's the key is you got to do the work. So uh, what would you, uh, you know, attribute to being able to, you know, for you grow the most, you know, is there something that you thought you did, you know, whether it be, you know, take your time or like you said, partner with other people, you know, what was the number one, you know, thing that you think or several things that really did allow you to go from, you know, owning a few single families to into the multifamily to where you are today, you know, um, anything? Well, initially, you know, the first probably 
13, 14, 15 years, I was on my own. So um, I'd say the number one thing that contributed to, to scaling in that regard was networking, putting, you know, going out every day, having a, a set of people that you wanted to call, uh, you know, have, whether it's, whether it's brokers, whether it's bankers, whether it's, um, uh, you know, property managers, whoever that, whatever the case may be, but always be taking action every day, you know, um, you know, looking at deals, analyzing deals. I mean, my gosh, especially in the single family world, um, you have to analyze a lot of properties to be able yeah. to find that one, you know, yeah. and then you walk them and you spend a lot of time. So every day I was spending time in my business, mm -hmm. um, in some form or fashion. And so, uh, yeah, you had to put in the work. But, um, you know, whenever I got into syndication, uh, the key is finding good partners that you have good synergies with and same thing. You're always taking action every day in some form or fashion, but, um, having partners, you can, you can go further together. Yeah. That's a, that's a big key. Yeah. And that's, you know, one of the challenges like I have personally is, I don't have any partners and I really have, don't want to bring any in. And there's probably, I realize that I can't, you know, there's only so much you can do, especially, you know, working full time. And one of the things I'll mention about what you just talked about and the key points that I picked up from it was um, consistency. It sounds like you are very consistent in, you know, working on this business, um, you know, every day or, you know, it, Mm -hmm. making sure you're staying and it's not something you do once a week or once a month or you started it, stopped it or so forth. It seems like it's something you are now at a point of, um, you know, doing on a daily basis. So how much time do you spend per day? I'm just curious on, you know, your business right now compared to, you know, your regular nine to five. Um, I'd probably say anywhere from two to four hours a day, probably. Okay. You're probably not watching a lot of TV then. <laughs> no, I really don't even know what's on TV. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm very similar. Like, you know, my sisters are so, oh, do you watch this? I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Um, yeah. You now, and I, similar, I, you know, I spend an hour in the morning, um, you know, going through, um, you know, my to-do list for the day and manage certain aspects of it. And then, you know, during, you know, what my lunch break at work or something, I may, you know, check emails and stuff. And then in the evening, I'll spend another hour or two hours just, um, you know, once the wife and kids go to bed, you know, cleaning mm -hmm. stuff up and with, you know, the business I'm in, I have, I'm, have that luxury to be able to do it at different odd hours of time and, you know, just wait for people's response. And of course what we talked about earlier, kind of building that team or partnership around you mm -hmm. um, is, you know, is very important. So. Absolutely. Um, so why haven't you left your full-time job? Out of curiosity? Well, the, the good and bad about having a, a great W2 job is it takes a lot of income to replace. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, I've been very blessed to have a, a great career mm -hmm. and uh, I earn a, a high W2. And so, um, you know, I want to be able to replace that and then some mm -hmm. before I can feel comfortable, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. even though I know what it takes from a number standpoint to be where I need to be, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm so used to paying taxes over the years that, <laughs> I, I'm, it's hard for me to think that I can really get by on that much because I'm going to be keeping more of it, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. or most pretty much all of it now with the way you can depreciation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's just simply a comfort level. I mean, I, I have a freedom number, so to speak, that I want to get to um, that mm -hmm. I know is more than I'll ever need to mm -hmm. do what I need to do. Uh, you know, I have my, my second um, child is going to, is going into college next year. So I have two kids in college and we have, uh, you know, we have phenomenal health insurance with, with my corporate job right now. And so, um, that's probably the, the majority reason is until the kids are out of the house, uh, or I hit that freedom number where I know I'll have no worries. Um, then I'll probably stick with the, stick with the job at least for a couple more years. Yeah. Yeah. Similar, you know, I have the, you know, very well paid W2 job and, you know, I've got, you know, like I said, a, a 16 and a nine year old. So for me, it's kind of, you know, I didn't even started college yet, 
but also I'll be, for, I'll be 45 this summer. And I look at it as working backwards. You know, if my investments equal or match my W2 job, uh, you know, I just look at it. It's one less year from 65 that I'm retiring, you know, I'm putting mm-hmm. that money away. You know, it's not like, you know, I'm out there buying, you know, fancy cars or anything like that. Um, you know, yeah. that money typically what I'm doing with, you know, 90% of it, you know, actually a lot, well, after taxes, about 90% of it, you know, because uncle Sam definitely, um, takes a good chunk of everything. Uh, mm-hmm. basically just reinvest it, you know, reinvest, put some yeah. away for a kid's school and, you know, I, I diversify as well. You know, it's, uh, you know, I don't put everything in one bucket, you know, put stuff in mixed avenue buckets just in case, you know, real estate does, you know, have a dip then, you know, hopefully something else. And same thing with, you know, the markets, which, you know, the markets, nobody can predict what the heck's going on. Yeah. You know, more yeah. In the, markets. The, the last couple of months are, are a good indicator of that. Well, even historically, you can see how the markets uh, respond. That's why I like multifamily real estate. Yep. It's uh, pretty steady throughout the whole thing. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to touch base on, on your multifamily, kind of from, you know, your business goals perspective on the multifamily, are you more of a, um, you know, when I say, uh, uh, investor who will look to get a value add, get it up to, uh, performing and sell it, or are you long-term buy and hold? What type of uh, multifamily are curiosity do you, or, uh, or a mix? So in my personal portfolio, I'm a buy and hold guy, you know, by nature. And uh, the only reason I've sold any of the stuff that I've sold over the last couple, three years is, is to put in the syndications, you know, I sold those things. Um, and because I had so much accumulated depreciation mm-hmm. held over, I could sell what I've sold so far and not have any taxes on it. So I was able to yeah. use the full amount um, to put into syndications because we invest our own money into our syndications as well. Okay. Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that, uh, other than that in the apartments, apartment deals, um, we have, uh, most of our time horizons are three to seven years okay. and we will either look to, um, sell or refi returns to capital and, uh, and then hold mm-hmm. for the long term. Mm-hmm. Um, so all your multifamily is a uh, rental. You don't do any for sale product, do you? Um, any First new construction, I'm um, oh. sorry, any like new construction, condos, no. or stuff, everything's um, existing uh, rental. Right. Typically we do BC value add deals, a okay. uh, hundred plus um, unit complexes. Mm-hmm. Uh, where do you, you know, curious, where do you find those types of deals? Is it again through the networks? I mean, you know, people, I, I know people joke a lot of time about like loop net and stuff like that, which is like the place for deals to go die essentially. Right, um, right. You know, do you have brokers you work with or is it more just word of mouth? Um, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, we that? work with, with brokers. Um, mm-hmm. We had, you know, when we first got together as partners, uh, Carl, uh, Rodney and I, um, my, uh, Carl Silvercrop is my partner out of mm-hmm. Dallas and Rodney Miller is my partner out of Oklahoma city. Okay. And so the three of us, you know, we, we, and I live in Missouri. And so mm-hmm. we have kind of a triangle around what we call the mid South, you know, the, yeah. uh, and so we like to buy deals in our area. We can, that we can drive to within a few hours. And so, you know, we all had, when we got together, we decided we were going to start, um, you know, make doing broker contacts and each day, each week we had a set number of brokers we needed to contact and, uh, and then we, you know, maintain those relationships over time and, and uh, to, to get our deal flow. And, uh, mm-hmm. and that's how we, that's how we get our deals just through mm-hmm. broker relationships. Yep. And from financing component, do you typically try and work with, um, you know, consistent lenders or, you know, do you, you know, because you got the track record now or how, how's that work? Well, I, um, you know, I, I did all my, I mean, until 2017, I didn't even know about Fannie Freddie. You know, it was all, <laughs> it, was all it was all community bank stuff. Yeah. And uh, even though I was working with a commercial banker um, mm-hmm. at, at my local community bank, it was uh, mm-hmm. still, you know, 20, 25 year and uh, recourse notes, yep. and they were five year terms uh, before you end up having to refi. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and they and so actually they were they were recourse loans, but so mm-hmm. I did all my work through them. Uh, and have a great relationship with them. But mm-hmm. now we, we do, um, we've done Fannie Mae, we've done mm-hmm. Freddie Mac, and we've done bridge deals, uh, mm-hmm. bridge mm-hmm. lenders. So mm-hmm. we've kind of done it all really, yeah. you know. Yeah. So is there uh, one you prefer over the other? Because I know, for, um, if I recall, the paperwork side of things, a lot of times when you're using the GSEs can get, um, 
you know, pretty, uh, you know, they usually ask for a lot. So I was just curious. Um, GSC. What, what is uh, well, Fannie or Freddie, government-sponsored entities. Oh, you know, oh Fannie's okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry, so, I just call them agencies. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, honestly, uh, you – I mean, there is a lot of paperwork, yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, not, not that I really have a preference because each mm -hmm. deal kind of dictates what mm – -hmm um what type of lender you can use mm -hmm. um you know because freddie for example you can't finance rehab mm -hmm. fanny you can mm -hmm. um they both have small balance uh, or, or freddie's a small balance lender you know under mm -hmm. under six million dollars um and fanny has a, a small balance program as well but um and then you know of course bridge lending a lot of times you can get 100% of your rehab finance on Brit with a bridge lender, whereas you can't with uh, the agency. And so, like I said, each deal kind of dictates what uh, what strategy you want to take. Yeah. So, how long did it take you to find a good property manager? <laughs> um. Well, uh, with my single family portfolio, or not my single family portfolio, but my personal portfolio, because I have yeah. single family and yeah. multi family yeah. apartments there as well. Um. The, uh, the very first property manager I found on that first property, it was a guy that showed me the property. He was managing it for the bank yeah. and um, here in Missouri. And I uh, uh, talked to him. We had, you know, we were like-minded and he agreed to manage it for me. And he manages all my properties in Missouri. And, wow. And um, in Arkansas, um, <clears throat> which is where I bought the, the, the apartment complex at 55 units that I 1031 into. Um, I work with a, a property management company there, uh, Trinity Multifamily. They're a, they're a, uh, you know, they probably have about 25,000 doors that they manage in 15, mm -hmm. 16 states now. And they're headquartered in, in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is where I, I grew up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I use them there. And then there's a couple properties in between that uh, I manage myself. Um, okay. One in Fayetteville, mm -hmm. uh, where the University of Arkansas is, my kids go. I bought a duplex mm -hmm. for them to live in. So I manage that myself. Nice. So, well, the reason I ask that question is, um, you know, usually the property management side of things is very challenging. Uh, it can you know, be for sure. We yeah, actually yeah. had to, um, we had a property management company that uh, didn't work out so well for us mm -hmm. on our last two deals. Um, and uh, we struggled with them. We gave them a lot of rope mm -hmm. and um, on the first property and it suffered uh but it was such a high cash flow property that even when it was n not doing very well it was still doing okay uh now that we switched over to a different property management company it's mm -hmm. knocking the, out of the park and um same with our other property we we gave them a very very sh uh short rope on that property and within a couple months uh, they were gone Mm -hmm. So as we, you know, start to get wrapping up, um, you know, I was going to ask you, where do you, where do you see your, you know, where do you see, what do you see for next three years for your, your business? And of course, you know, it's very challenging in today's times to even forecast what's going to happen next week. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, from, you know, your business plan and stuff, you know, where, you know, do you have plans or where you ex want to be in the next three years, whether it's diversify into, you know, another market or just continue to grow? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right, right now we're focusing on, uh, you know, our, our kind of strategy is to, is to accumulate 700 to 1200 units in a market. Um, and then, and then move on and do that in, an, in another market. Um, right now we're focusing on Tulsa. Okay. Uh, and, um, uh, so our goal is to accumulate 500 plus units a year. Um, and, uh, and then also, um, you know, recruit more capital partners so we can maybe get that to a thousand units a year. Um, that's, there's a lot of money out there and uh, there's also a lot of people looking for it. And so, <laughs> you know, we're, we're putting our track record together slowly, consistently developing, uh, you know, good relationships. And so uh, ultimately in the next three years, I'd like to see us owning 2,500 units minimum. Okay. And just out of curiosity, on average, what would you say you pay per, pay per door? when you talk about 500 units, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, depending on the market, I mean, there's, we're in, in the Tulsa market, we're in, you know, just east of Tulsa or in Dallas. I mean, so you're looking anywhere from 32 a door to 88 a door. 
a hundred a door, depending on what you're finding in Dallas. I mean, you may be, you may even find some C properties for a hundred thousand a door in Dallas, yeah. which is insane to me. But so, you know, from a scale perspective, then you're, you know, you're basically doing between call it 15 and 50 million a year is kind of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, our, our, yeah. our sweet spot for deal size is, is five to 15 million. Yep. And, okay. uh, and like I said, we want, we want to accumulate at least one and a quarter of those. Nice. Is Tulsa, um, you know, one of the, the market, I see, you know, I hear a lot of rumblings about Tulsa. So I'm just curious, is it, uh, you know, an area that's projected for some pretty good growth over the next decade or so? Because I hear a lot it's, of good things about it. Yeah, it's um, a good, steady, stable market. Uh, it used to be kind of an oil, more of known as an oil town, but it's, mm -hmm. it's diversified a lot in its employer base. Um, and uh, oil, oil is still a part of it, obviously, but, um, you know, they're becoming a big tech uh, town. Okay. Um, you know, they have a lot of, a lot of technology companies uh, moving in there and all, Tesla, they're, they're one of the, the two finalists for Tesla okay. uh, between Austin and Tulsa. Mm -hmm. So we're keeping our fingers crossed, but you know, <laughs> yeah. we're realistic too. Mm -hmm. uh, have you, uh, you know, ever considered looking at, um, you know, office or other types of uh, uses um, besides multifamily or even like student housing or anything like that? Or is it you typically more um, just a straight, you know, multi, I'll call it, you know, uh, W2 employee um, rental type property? Yeah, workforce housing is, mm -hmm. is, is what we, um, it's what we kind of are focused on. Yep. At least, uh, at least for the next you know, three to five years, we really want mm -hmm. to to accumulate a large number of doors and refine our processes and kind of perfect mm -hmm. the process. If there is ever sort of a thing as perfecting a process, mm -hmm. you know, it's always constant improvement. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, um, you know, that's where our main focus is. Uh, office, I'm not really too sure about how that's going to go, with, <laughs> especially in the light of what's going on. But. Yeah. But um, I think there's a lot more inconsistency there uh, as far as uh, the future of, of that sector. Uh, self storage is a great place. Um, mobile home parks is a great a great place to park some money. But um, you know, not to say we wouldn't do it in the future. But right now, it's it's BC BC apartment complexes. So sounds like you know you're you got your plan together and you're sticking to your guns, which is good. You know, in a sense, because sometimes you see yeah. some people try to do too much, you know, and, yeah. and diversify into too many different markets and, uh, you know, never become an expert in the one that they started at. So, yeah. um, okay. My last question, uh, before we sign off today is if you could give advice to, you know, anybody out there listening, um, you know, in regards to, again, trying to, you know, start with your side, your side hustle and turn into a business, um, you know, what would it be? Cause you know, as you can see, you've been able to build a very large, uh, portfolio while still again doing the, the nine to five thing and you know I've you know I, I have the scars from that and I know it takes a lot of work and so forth and you know I really have a, a ton of respect for people especially yourself who do this because it's not easy and it shows people out there that you know you just don't have to be a number with an employee you know as an employer you know you can actually go try and do better for you your family or whatever your um, you know your interests are so just curious if you had any last Last yeah, second. yeah absolutely, advice. man. It, it's, it's up to you to take charge of your own life, you know. Um, but the first thing I would, I would say is, is get educated. There's a lot of resources out there to do, to do so. Um, get educated, find, uh, not necessarily a paid mentor, but find a mentor uh, who's doing what you want to do and, and take them to lunch. Find a way to add value to what they're doing so that you can learn from them. And, uh, and then uh, take action. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Take action. Take what you learned and go do something with it. Because if you don't, you're just wasting everybody's time. And if you have, if you have someone who's helping you along the process, you know, from a mentorship standpoint, and you take action, they're going to be more likely to you know, be your biggest cheerleader and help you be successful. And then also, once you get to that point, you do take action, be persistent. Don't give up because you're going to have setbacks. You're going to have you know, bad things that happen uh, along the way. Um, but keep your head down, work through it, uh, and find a, find a way to keep going because it's not all rosy out there, but, um, a lot of hard work and, and persistence will get you a long way.
So great advice. And Mike, thank you for joining us today. If people want to reach out, connect with you, uh, what's the best way for them to connect? Uh, you can go to our website, tridentmultifamily.com, tridentmultifamily.com. Uh, connect with us on Facebook or LinkedIn at Trident Multifamily on our pages there. Um, you can send me an email, mike at tridentmultifamily.com, or even give me a call, 417-576-8850. Happy to talk real estate and help anybody I can. Well, Mike, thanks for joining us today. And everyone out there listening, thank you for joining us. And take care and have a good day.